Anivar is a drug, right? It's a very mild drug, um, anabolic drug, and they've studied it in burn victims, and it does great for burn victims. And they've studied it in teenage burn victims. And when they did, all the kids in the study had more muscle mass and their muscle mass and their penises got longer, like grew in length. And so how do you tell kids not to take Anavar? And I just want to know, when does that window, when does that door close? And I don't know. When does that door close? Clearly that door closes at some point. Otherwise, we would know. We need a this. more plates, more dates video on this. imagine if you're I gotta the write... one that discovered actually it carries clear into your 70s? I'm going to have to ask Derek to make a video. Because he can explain it for real. He would probably know. Probably know all the studies and everything. Really, if we've ever needed be a really more... fun. Yeah, it'd be yeah. a really fun video. Maybe this video we could put up and then he, he could respond to it. Derek, let us know. Let us know, buddy. Warning! Out of Sacramento, California! Woo! What you gonna do? Better. Stronger. Son of a bitch. Faster. Oh, yeah! One, two, three, you're up. Okay. I have a new superhero movie origin story. So, Merrick Health is gonna send me send me some oxandrolone, which is Anivar. Uh -huh. And by the way, in um, in studies, you know how they always say uh, people are like, oh, you're taking steroids, right? Your your dick's gonna get smaller. That's... Well, they, they mean your balls are gonna get smaller, yeah. obviously. But they no say, no, I know. But Anivar, in um, that's what Mad Dog says in Bigger, Stronger, Faster. Who needs them, right? But your <laughs> testicle strength. Who needs them? No, but seriously. Um, the Anavar in studies of teenage kids, right? This is legitimate. In teenage kids, they've done studies of Anavar in burn victims. And in every case, it made their penis longer. Really? So how do you tell kids not to take it when it'll get you more jacked and, and make your penis bigger? When does that window close? When does, when does, you know what? when does that window close? Maybe the window's not closed. Maybe, a, okay, I don't hey, know. So you got, this, you got this through your doctor? But here's my origin story, right? So okay. the guy said, hey, make sure you get the oxandrolone in time because if you if you don't get it in time it mm -hmm. could melt in the heat mm -hmm. so what if my anavar got mutated by the heat yes and it activated some sort of myostatin reaction so it was like a myostatin inhib inhibitor inhibitor oh yeah because of the heat yeah my anavar melts down i take it and i become a superhero <laughs> i think that's the way to go somebody's here i think it's brad let him in let him in let him in thank you chloe What's up, How buddy? You Russell, oh, nice to meet you. Come on in. I was just um, recording a quick origin story for a superhero movie, so I don't forget it. No, but I was just saying my um, my drugs from Merrick Health are on the way, right? My an my Anavar, which is a anabolic. But the guy said, make sure that you pick it up as soon as possible because it could melt in the heat. So I was saying to Russell, what if it melted in the heat and it had some sort of reaction and then I just took it and I got super huge. Now tell him, actually, now this is a great story, but it's not the part of the story I'm really most interested in. Tell him the sort of side note Okay, detail. so the side note was this. Anivar is a drug, right? It's a very mild drug, um, anabolic drug, and they've studied it in burn victims and it does great for burn victims. And they've studied it in teenage burn victims. And when they did, all the kids in the study had more muscle mass and their muscle mass and their penises got longer, like you grew in length. And so how do you tell kids not to take Anavar? And I just <laughs> want to know, when does that window, when does that door close? And I don't know. When does that door close? Clearly that door closes at some point. Otherwise we would know. We need this. a more plates, more dates video. Can you imagine on this? if I you're the write... one that discovered actually it carries clear into your seventies. I'm going to have to ask Derek to make a video. Cause he can explain it for real. He would probably know. Probably know all the studies and everything. Really, if we've ever needed be a Derek really Moore. fun, yeah, it'd be yeah. a really fun video. Maybe this video we could put up and then he he could respond to it. Derek, let us know. Let us know, buddy. <laughs> let us know. Smokey, get this to your man. <laughs> let us know. Yeah. Well, we're here with our buddy Brad Kearns, who is a great, great writer. Wrote one of my favorite books on the ketogenic diet called The Keto Reset. Keto Reset Diet. Keto Reset Diet with Mark Sisson. Many more. You and Mark Keto Sisson. Keto for Life follow up book. So most books, instant pot cookbooks. We just threw it out there. Tell, tell me the books that you've written. Oh my gosh, I've written. So you've written a uh, lot with Mark Sisson, right? Yeah, in the last uh, fifteen years, we got together to work on the Primal Blueprint book, lifestyle online courses, and all that. That was in two thousand eight, so that was pretty cool because that was like my cold turkey 
foray into the primal paleo diet at the very beginning. And we got one of the first books out called The Primal Blueprint, and that was a, a bestseller and credited with you know, kickstarting this primal paleo movement that became so popular. And then on the heels of that, in 2017, uh, this keto thing was starting to float around. So we had the opportunity to write a book about that. That meant Mark and I had this immediate deep, into, deep immersion into this uh, ketogenic diet, yeah. getting the little uh, blood meters and pricking my finger so much that I got scar tissue on my middle finger and cutting the carbs back and learning all about the, the benefits of that. But as I'm sure we'll get to in the show, it's a, it's a constant evolution and you have to keep on your toes and keep sharp and keep testing and refining and experimenting. And you and Mark, you guys are leading the charge for that because you've been messing around with stuff yeah. for decades and never content to say, yeah, I'm on my salad diet now and it's working for me and I'm never changing it. And um, it, it's kind of nice to constantly be exposed to new information and, and, and work on it and test it out. Yeah, and the more, the more I do things, the more I realize yeah. that sometimes going back to things works really well. Like for me, I believe carnivore is a great intervention. I don't think it's a great diet for a real long term. Maybe for some people it is. Uh, maybe for Sean Baker, it works perfect mm -hmm. for him. Um, for me personally, it's not great all the time, but I always end up going back to it. Like every once in a while, I'll go back to it for a couple weeks. I'm even thinking like now, um, before I turn 50, sort of going back to the carnivore diet, because I get the leanest and I mm -hmm. feel the best, but it's, it's kind of hard for me, to be honest. It's hard for me to just stick to eating just those things. Well, that's a great word you use, intervention, because we all deserve, you know, to, to take a look at uh, the terrible influences of modern life. And it requires some intervention to stop the runaway train of disease and demise and accelerated aging that's going to happen unless we do some incredible effort to, to counter that. And so when anyone I'm around spouts off with that favorite phrase, hey, look, it's all about moderation, everything in moderation, I'll go crazy. And it's like, no, it's <laughs> not, because what we have is such an extreme offense to health with the billboards and the marketing and the cultural traditions and, oh, and my kid's birthday is at Chuck E. Cheese and the parents are invited and we're going to wolf down that crap too and start these kids off on that path. It's yeah. brutal. So we have to be extreme and highly devoted and willing to do things like an intervention such as hey a 30-day carnivore experiment has been a health awakening for many people because they were sensitive to these plant toxins and they didn't know about it and that's the worst thing i mean it's like if you know that eating the, the chuck e cheese and the hot fudge sundae gives you all kinds of problems later and you shouldn't have done it but you did it anyway but if you're thinking that your kale smoothie and your Caesar salad with chicken and dressing on it is the, the highest level of health because that's what the commercial messaging has told you, boy, that's when it's really time to wake up and say, maybe I can be better. Yeah, so I know you're, you're a free thinker. You don't do everything with Mark, right? So you, you've um, progressed to a point where now you've even changed your diet. You're not necessarily doing keto anymore. You're, you're on to a new thing. You're out discovering new stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about like what you've been onto and what you've been discovering since you sort of left doing keto? Yeah, the, the keto diet, um, you know, we were, we were hardcore into that for several months and testing it in the process of writing a book. I think it's important to have that deep immersion. Just like when I first got together with Mark, well, he's an old friend. He used to coach me when I was a professional triathlete. And so we have a decades long relationship. But in 2008, he said, look, we got to work on this book. We're going to put this out. It's the 10 laws of the primal blueprint. Um, you don't eat grains, you eat the ancestral foods. And I'm like, uh, so uh, is oatmeal a grain? He's like, yeah, man, it's a grain. I go, what about my morning cereal, granola? Are those grains? He's like, yeah, those are grains It's all the stuff too. you loved as a triathlete. <laughs> right, that high carb, uh, you know, we were trying to eat the most natural sources of complex carbohydrates. And we were burning off a lot of calories too, which negates a lot of the negative impact of overstuffing your face with processed carbohydrate. But, you know, that was a real awakening to go, okay, now I'm eating primally. And I went right into it cold turkey. And so same with keto. It's like, okay, here's the deal. You got to keep your carbs down at 50 grams per day. It's the complete opposite diet, basically, right? Like of it's, what you were doing. It's opposite, especially of, yeah, yeah. Especially of a high calorie burning, hard training athlete. Um, but it has so many you know, highly regarded, scientifically validated health benefits. And it's a great intervention from someone who's stuffing their face with processed foods because you can't do that. 
And by and large, the most damaging foods that we're, we're seeing are uh, the processed carbohydrates and the refined industrial seed oils and the foods that are made with those things. When you're on the keto train, yeah. you're eating eggs and steak and a lot of produce. I think and the only problem with the keto train is the keto train got too powerful. And the keto train became this train that, you know, you could say, hey, this is keto, right? You'd, you'd call a food keto when no food is like necessarily <laughs> inherently keto, right? It's like, it's about what macros are in it or whatever. But, you know, you'd have like a bar or or some sort of Pop-Tart. Yeah, that's what that's, I was thinking. Oh, yeah. You know, it's so-called so called keto. And that's great that we can we can have foods with better ingredients. Keto left the primal side of it behind. Yeah, right? but but the, <laughs> yeah. I feel the, the problem in, in with that is of, uh, profit, it became yeah. yeah it became so commercialized and mm. big that you're just getting so far away from real food, you know, and then that that's still considered like keto. And then you have people that are doing like the real keto. Like when I did keto, mm. I did it pretty hardcore. I tested my ketones three times a day. Um, when I was doing keto and you guys wrote the keto reset, I was already about six months or eight months into it, maybe a year this into it by then. trendsetter people. That's oh, yeah. Well, all we, there is to it. He's well, Mark the, and I were always like yeah. pushing the boundaries, you know, of, of everything. And so uh, we got, when I got into keto, it was uh, Jimmy Moore, who I actually just went to jail for some bad shit, <laughs> um, which is pretty crazy. I don't think um, he can stay on keto in jail, but he'll try. No, no, no. Yeah. Jimmy Moore got caught um, some underage, which is crazy because so Jimmy Moore was a guy who wrote the book. Keto Clarity, he was somebody I really looked up to, um, but this is actually interesting and not to um, talk shit about him, but he, when I actually met him, he was about 300 pounds. And I, I felt like I went to Wally World and it was closed because like he was somebody I really looked up to. It was all about being like 400, he was like 400 and something pounds and he got down to 230. And then when I met him, he was back up over 300 pounds, like easily. And he didn't look like somebody that was on a diet or, you know. And so I was like eating religiously keto and testing my blood ketones and going, oh, this guy, Jimmy Moore, he does this and he does that. And I'm going to follow what he's doing because he lost all this weight. And, and then I met him and I was like, oh, man, this is a train wreck, you know. <laughs> and um, and it, was, it, was, it was really interesting because it was somebody who I had put a lot of um, – I put a lot of weight into their words and what he and what he said, and then when I met him, it instantly just flipped, and I said, "I, I don't have any respect for that. That's not the that's Wally not what World I'm references to do. from the Chevy Chase movie Vacation. If you don't get that, <laughs> listeners, but that was a, a classic. Oh my gosh, uh, the disappointment. Uh, I think you know everyone struggles with uh, trying to get life right. And so he's done a lot of good work, wrote, written some good books, and then still struggling with his weight, I he, think was an interesting position to present to the public and say, He was hey, a pioneer, you know, though. So yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's in, a, right. in another respect, he was yeah. the guy who made it all happen. And so um, for, for that, he definitely, you know, deserves, you know, deserves to be, uh, that deserves to be said, you know, um, no matter what else he, he did. He was the pioneer of the, the keto movement. Um, but Mark and I moved on from listening to people like him to listening to people more like Dominic D'Agostino. And Dominic D'Agostino could deadlift 675 pounds for 10 reps on a five-day fast. And right. like, that's my guy. Right. Coming, and, in, coming in five-day fasted with no food and, and throwing the weight around. Impressive. And right away, like really early in the keto diet, um, when I was doing it, I remember – uh, getting the opportunity, luckily, because I made Bigger, Stronger, Faster. A lot of people know Mark and I, and I was able to call Dom D'Agostino. He's like, yeah, just give me a call. I'd love to talk to you. I'm like, okay, great. So I called and talked to him for about two hours about keto. And like the first question I asked him is, can you stay on this for more than two weeks? And he just laughed. He's like, I've been on it for a couple of years. Yeah. Luis yeah. Villasenor from Keto Gains has been strict keto for 22 years and counting yep. uh, and competing in powerlifting, competing in bodybuilding. So these and when you, people are showing what's possible. Yeah, when you yeah. see somebody that does it right also, like we said, that it is not into the commercialized version of keto, yeah. um, like Luis, so you see him, he looks amazing all the time. You know, and I think there's a lot of people like that. There's another guy, Goody Beats, that's on uh, Instagram a lot, and he looks great. He's always in great shape, and he does the keto diet, you know, the way it should be done. He really prioritizes the protein mm -hmm. and, um, you know, keeps his body in, in check. Yeah, I think for the for the average person that's not going to commit to something that extreme, um, it was a little bit disturbing to watch the keto movement explode because of all the processed foods that came out. And 
um, my next door neighbor who also lives next door to Thomas DeLauer, who's a big keto uh, personality yeah. on YouTube. So we live one door away. He just moved into my neighborhood. But the neighbor was showing me all his keto items uh, and, and proudly proclaiming how he's you know loving this diet. So he's got his bagels. He's got his waffles. He's got his this. He's got his that. And it's like, wow, look at the ingredients on this thing. And indeed, there's a low amount of net carbohydrates on there. Yeah. But we have to remember when you bring up Dom D'Agostino, one of the great researchers at the keto diet and the beneficial effects for um, seizures, for performance with the Navy SEALs, the underwater diving, um, the best effects come from starvation, from fasting. Yeah. And so we're trying to hack it with this, uh, I called it the, you know, the bacon and butter phenomenon where people were running out and consuming a bunch of fat in the name of, uh, you know, generating the benefits of the ketogenic diet. So that sort of got confused somewhere along the way to think, hey, as long as you consume a whole bunch of fat and watch your carbohydrates, you're going to have a health awakening. Uh, so I think maybe the smoke is clearing now and things are settling down. But you asked me way back a question about how my evolution has yeah. gone. And one thing that's really come to light in recent times is that when we go on these restrictive diets, we are getting a, a ton of health benefits and anti-inflammatory and immune boosting and cell repair and all these things. But these benefits are coming from the stress mechanisms that are kicked into gear when you restrict carbohydrates or when you go into intermittent fasting and say, I'm on a 16-8 pattern now. I fast 16 hours every day and I eat for during this time of eight hour window. All those things have shown to have effectiveness and people are touting them as wonderful. But we have to remember, and Jay Feldman, Energy Balance Podcast, has done a good job enumerating this. These are kicking in stress mechanisms. And that is, in fact, the way that they deliver the intended benefits. So when you're fasted, you kick into better immune function, better cell repair anti-inflammatory processes. You're alert and your, uh, your cognitive power is better because uh, you're making ketones for your brain, which are uh, really well used and burned cleanly for energy. Um, but when I sat back and realized, look, uh, at, at this point, uh, I still call myself an athlete, even though I'm 57 years old. I'm trying to perform magnificent. Still beats. shredded, by the way. I'm trying, for anybody man. that doesn't know out there, you guys don't know what's under this shirt. Oh my gosh. <laughs> guys, uh, still shredded. But I, I like training. I like recovering, and I'm battling against chronological age, which is a huge stressor for me trying to do what I'm trying to do because I'm not 27 anymore. And so if I mix in all these stress factors that exist already, my age, my hard workouts, I'm hanging on by a thread trying to recover from these workouts, and we have hectic high-stress modern life with plenty of other forms of stress, do I personally, just for a moment, I'll say, speak from my own experience and then put it out there to you listening, do I need to ever fast uh, for health boost? And I'm thinking, no, I need to consume nutritious food at all times. So there's no justification to consume junk food. Even if you're an athlete and you just burned it off and now you want to go get your hot fudge sundae, the athlete probably needs nutrition and nutrient density more so than the average Joe who just is asked to sit at a desk, get up, walk to the bathroom, walk to the parking lot, walk back to the desk. They don't have an intense nutritional need because their body's not doing anything. But for me, I want to have an extremely clean diet and I want to get maximum nutrient density at all times so that I can perform and recover, which is the most reliable path to longevity. It's not fasting. It's maintaining lean muscle strength throughout life. And you guys know that better than anybody. It's like if you walk around with good muscle mass, you're revealing that you have good metabolic health. Lane Norton says that all the time, like, forget testing your body fat. Let's just look at your muscle mass because that means that you're, you're, you're fine. You know, you're burning energy and you're, you're healthy because you're, you're able to put out this work. So, you know, in keto, I know we talk a lot about nutrient density. Even in carnivore, we talk about, you know, eating meat because it's more nutrient dense. Um, what else are you, what else have you been like adding in and what other nutrients have you been looking for sort of on this new venture you've been looking and does this have a name of what you're doing now? Well, um, I call it my nutrient-dense diet. I'm in the nutrient-dense dietary camp, right? Instead of the keto camp or yeah, the yeah, whole yeah. food plant-based camp or the strict carnivore camp or the carnivore-ish camp, I think it's a, uh, more appealing to look at it that way. Um, Mark and I are talking about this concept of meat and fruit, which you were the yes. first guy to 
um, come up with coin the term uh, fruit meat repeat. That's yeah. like you know what? That's a good concept right there. That's it, like a book title right there. It, it is, and I think I, I really hope you guys go through it that because I think that um, you know Mark was one that was always pushing me to eat more fruit. He's like, I don't think it's, it's not going to make you fat. And then um, it was interesting because we had a conversation just like a couple weeks ago. Where he's like, nobody thinks fruit makes you fat. And I'm like, I think you're out of touch with people, man. Because I, I think a lot of people do think it makes you fat. And, I, mm-hmm. and you know what's, what's interesting? Because um, we got a little debate about whether or not it makes you fat. And I said, I think the actual, the people in the keto carnivore like space think it makes you fat. Mm-hmm. But I think people that are like just normal everyday people, they don't think it makes you fat. They just don't eat it. Yeah, good point. <laughs> but I think yeah. that um, there are a lot of people that have been convinced that like fruit is bad for you. And part of that might be part of like what Mark and I used to preach was like, hey, there's a war on carbs. But we mm-hmm. always emphasize that the war on carbs was like a war on processed foods and a war on junk. You know, yeah. cut all that stuff out of your diet and you'll yeah. get in shape. The book cover with, with the gun on it had, you know, bagels on the barrel of the gun. It didn't have, it didn't skewer a pineapple on there. Yeah. It's really the war on processed carbs is more accurately. It is. It's just a about. simple name. You know, it's like to yeah. make things simple and easy. Yeah. And also, um, you know, sometimes I just go into that mode too, where I'm like, well, I don't necessarily want to go carnivore and just eat meat. So I'll just have a war on carbs, which adds in like dairy and some other things that you can have that still don't have carbohydrates in them. And you can sort of stick to that kind of diet as well so like mark and i just use, like to use diets as tools i think like every diet's a tool like you could do meat and fruit for two weeks you could do carnivore for two weeks you could do keto for two weeks you could do whatever i think and, and dance around these things a lot and play around with them rather than just stick to the same thing all the time yeah i mean really the starting point for any of this is to eliminate processed foods from your diet uh sis and i have called them the big three in numerous books where we're talking about the categories of refined industrial seed oils, refined grains, refined sugars, and all the processed foods that are made with one or more of one than of those three agents. You're talking about most restaurant meals because most restaurant meals are cooked in this unhealthy seed oil that's cheap and easy to use and um, most of the processed my, frozen packaged foods. My personal opinion, I think it's all oils. I just think people shouldn't have oil. I mean, oil goes in a car. You know, (laughs) and um, when you put oil in people, it's like putting sugar in people because, you know, sugar is just like one piece of the puzzle of that plant and it doesn't have the fiber in it, it doesn't have all the other things. And oil is kind of the same thing. It's like you're just getting the fat. And we know from Lane Norton and others that fat stores easily as fat. Mm -hmm. So why am I dumping, you know, Mark and I keep talking about this, like your salad dressing doesn't need oil. Like Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you just need balsamic vinegar, Mm -hmm. you know, and that might go against uh, Mark's Primal Kitchen uh, yeah, <laughs> brand, yeah, but if, but I, I just yeah. I don't really believe in oils and I don't really use them yeah. at all. Well, you know? Mark's been talked out of the salad as the centerpiece of his diet by Paul Saladino. I, was I right remember there. that. That I was, was right big... there in the room when when Saladino verbally cornered him and and got his you know boxing gloves up. And Paul's like, "Well, why are you eating that salad then?" After he finished his spiel about how the plant toxins don't provide that much nutrition, yeah. and they can potentially be problematic. And Mark was like. Uh, the crunchy texture, I don't know, you know, like we didn't have any good reasons left. It, yeah. was, a, it was a really turning point moment for all of us because Paul really stormed to the scene and he comes with, you know, this aggression and this really clever, you know, now Hollis Instagram is this is bullshit, that's bullshit. Yeah, he's and, everything tied up with a nice little bow on it. Like, and it's really, yeah. um, you know, may, maybe some people think it's a little too much, but like we are fighting the most massive battle and Paul Saladino has been in the medical system and seen it. So we need to start shouting and really waking people up and shaking them and saying, don't eat this well, shit. Here's the it's real, the real thing, right? Paul could go on there and say, you know what? You guys might think kale's really good for you, but it's really not that great for you. And here's why. And nobody will watch it. But if you go on there and go, look, <laughs> kale's, kale's bullshit. bullshit, boom, you get clicks, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And I think he knows Same that. Same with Liver King. And so know? he might not yeah. mean like, it's like, you know, yeah, exactly. Things can get taken out of context really easy that way. Um, well, he means it, so he's not. No, I know, I know. He's he not mean, taken out of context. Kale is bullshit. Yeah, period. No, no, I know. He, yeah. I know he means it, but yeah. I'm saying like, um, there, there can't be nuance. Doesn't sell. Boring mm, voices you know? fall to the side, right? You have to yeah. be interesting first and foremost if you want to catch people's attention. Yeah. So you say, hey, this is toxic. This is bad. Like saying protein powder is bullshit. He took a lot of flack for that because, mm. I mean, how many people use protein powder yeah. that are in amazing yeah. shape? Yeah. But. Does anybody actually really need it? I would argue he's kind of right that nobody does yeah. really need it's it. It's not bullshit. It's convenient. 
Yeah. And don't tell me it's bullshit when, you know, we're trying to exist in real life and not everyone has five it's, hours a day to dedicate to health. You and, know? and that's and that's where it becomes important. Who, yeah. Like the people that use it because they they need to use it because of time or because of whatever. Right. That, yeah. And look, we we traffic in circles around this giant building with people coming in and out all the time. And um, that's great that everyone here is really immersed into the scene and can talk through it. And then I interact with real people and I get a kick out of like I gather with my childhood friends once in a while and we hang out and have some food and whatever, just, you know, talking through things and my buddy will come up to me with a plate full of nachos that he bought on takeout and, and he says, Brad, nachos, healthy, yes or no? And that's, <laughs> that's the level of consciousness and the level of awareness that this person's at because they're busy uh, running a financial operation and have their brain in other areas. And yeah. so they want, we want quick answers and simple solutions. And of course, that's a difficult way to proceed when you're trying to get you know, to a higher level. But that's the reality is we don't have a lot of time you to explain knock the those, nuances. Knock those nachos out of his hand and say nachos are bullshit. <laughs> Depends and what's just... on them. If there's a whole bunch of steak, I'll yeah. go to Dos Coyotes, yeah. Sacramento, yeah. California. You get those Santa Fe nachos with the blue corn chips and double steak. No complaints there. And the nice guacamole. Oh, yeah, baby. Dos Coyotes, there's two of them right by my house. Oh, yeah. They're dangerous. That's great stuff. Yeah. I can't go there because they're dangerous. You know, too much, too many carbs um, for me. Well, go burn them off the next day. I, right? I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can I interrupt you? Where do you put rice on, on in this conversation of processed carbohydrates? I know, I mean, I know I mean, we've all sort of figured it out. It's a good question. Bread, pasta, you know, cupcakes, not good for you. Yeah. Corn, rice, where do you put those? Uh, well, rice is, of course, a grain like corn. And so it's a uh, high carbohydrate food that has minimal nutritional benefit, right? There's just not much in there except for the calories. And a lot of people enjoy it because it has uh, low toxin. You know, it's not that offensive like bread is with wheat and gluten and the things that really rip people apart if they're sensitive. So a lot of people are touting white rice as one of the best carbohydrate inclusions when you're just trying to increase your carb intake and or enjoy your life. So we do want to have things that are sustainable. And so if someone says, strict carnivore, uh, Chris Bell recommends you'll get lean and shredded, but you can't eat anything except meat, eggs, and fish, it's tough for people to deal with, and they might want to go to the sushi bar and have the rice underneath the fish and then have it be more sustainable. So it's sort of like a... Um, least you know, offensive? Uh, Is it like yeah, the least offensive sort yeah, of? Yeah, one of the least offensive, yeah, especially the white rice, where we've always bought, gone and gone out of our way to try to get brown rice in the old days well, like it's is it so much healthier than be, white rice but be, it's like now it's the opposite you know because you can use things to fill your body up that are not necessarily nutrient dense but like things like rice right like it's not it's not a lot of nutrients in it but for like a bodybuilder it doesn't have a lot of extra bs in mm -hmm. it like you said and so it doesn't have a lot of there's not a lot of extra in it it's just strict carbohydrate for a bodybuilder to like, you know, help them add calories to their diet or something, or like you said, just make or something. Triathlete. Yeah, for just sure. Make, yeah. Just make something better. So, in a way, sometimes you look for things that aren't so nutrient dense, like even like adding um, lettuce. Like a lot of times, when mm -hmm. I even when I do carnivore, I'll tell people like, you know, if if you're not getting full on just eating meat, maybe just have some like iceberg lettuce because there's literally nothing in it. It's just water. Right. There's, you know? no, there's no plant toxins. There, there's not any toxins in it. Just a lot of it. chewy, crunchy texture and, to enjoy. And so if you make yeah. like a burger bowl with like, I, I get the shreds. It's called iceberg shreds. It's like shredded head mm. of iceberg lettuce. And you just throw a couple patties on that and you eat that like almost like a salad with no dressing. It's really good. Yeah. And it just it's just more filling, right? So like you said, a little bit more sustainable. So the reason I actually eat, if I do eat iceberg lettuce, the reason I eat it is because nothing in it. So I eat it on purpose because there's nothing in yeah. it, but I know it's going to fill me up a little yeah. bit. So I think what we're getting to these days is there's a lot of validity to this concept of uh, taking a look at the potential reactivity of plant toxins and perhaps excluding those from your diet. And the four main categories are, uh, as Dr. Paul Saladino describes, uh, roots, seeds, stems, and leaves. These are the plants that have the highest level of toxins guess what? As a matter of fact, they also happen to be on the list of plant superstars. So the more nutritional benefit that's touted, such as kale or spinach or things like that, they also go hand in hand with having more toxins in general. And hmm. so 
um, antioxidants, polyphenols, all these good words that we hear um, to, to, to go and reach for those foods. Interestingly enough, and this is something I had to learn because I'm like in the idiot camp too. I don't, I don't have the botany or the scientific background to realize, but when Dr. Saladino explained this really well, when you're consuming that kale smoothie, you're not drinking a bunch of antioxidants and getting this benefit in your body from, from choking down uh, the smoothie. What's happening is you're consuming the poisons that are contained in the plant, and the body is mounting an internal antioxidant defense response. So the liver is kicking up the production of glutathione, that's the master internally produced antioxidant, to fight off the reaction to the plant. And this is not a bad thing. This is how plant medicine works, uh, plant compounds to help address uh, whatever, whatever's going on. Uh, but in the diet, it can give a net overall positive benefit by having a high antioxidant diet. However, at what cost, we now have to ask ourselves. And that's where we look at the reactivity, the side effects of consuming the toxin and mounting that defense response that could be really problematic because it could uh, lead to leaky gut syndrome and things that'll tank your health while you've been pursuing health by eating all these wonderful, colorful uh, plant superstar foods. Yeah. You know, I, I try to tell people, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And a lot of times, like, that's what I see with a lot of this stuff is like... Um, don't let good be the enemy of perfect either. Yeah. Like you're trying Strength to... Strength is never a weakness. Weakness... <laughs> wait, can they both work? I don't know. Okay, go on. Well, you, you know, just the idea that like... Um, telling people not to eat kale, that's not really the problem. The problem is the people eating Oreos, you know? <laughs> and so like Mark and I choose not to, and, and mm. I love what Paul's doing, I think it's yeah, great. Yeah, that's a it's, good point though. Cool. We have a tiered, uh, yeah, we have a it, triage system here. Yeah, it's like for the most here. part, you don't have to worry about the people that are eating kale, they're pretty healthy already, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. the, and so like a lot of these things that I see happening, I actually think is is more mental. Like I, I see a lot of people online that are like, oh, I ate this and everything hurt and then I ate this and everything was fine. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know that that's actually ever been proven. Like I have a lot of chronic pain, mm -hmm. so I don't believe a lot of the hype about the carnivore diet, like relieving pain. It helps, keep put, keeps your inflammation down a little bit, yeah. but I've been on a very strict carnivore diet and every time I go into Merrick Health and get my CRP done, my C-reactive protein, yeah. it's always high because huh. I have chronic pain. Huh. So it's always going to be high. The carnivore diet doesn't do anything to fix it, heal it, change it. You know, And so in those respects, I just think that um, a lot of that stuff's yet to be proven and we don't have any science behind it. So mm -hmm. I actually stopped throwing that stuff around because when I first started doing it, I thought the carnivore diet was really healing my body. But yeah. all, all it was really doing was like I was in good shape at the time. And I was just getting stronger because I was prioritizing protein, which is good. And I felt good. My inflammation was, was fairly low at the time. But I'm just saying, like, I don't think that that lasts forever. And I don't think that mm. the body necessarily, like, works that way. Like, I haven't gotten out of pain because of food yet. I wonder if you could measure your CRP and then go on a five-day fast and see if you could drop that thing from the response of fasting. Which That'd is be very common, interesting. I yeah. think that's something I can talk to uh, Merrick about and maybe yeah. get my blood work done yeah. and then do yeah. it. Because that would be very interesting to know because like I'm a little bit, you know, I get a little bit mad at these things. It's funny. I was having a conversation with Thomas DeLauer mm -hmm. about like the keto diet. Neighbor, because, yeah. Yeah. Well, Thomas has changed his thoughts a lot and yeah. I think it's great that he's yeah. changed his thoughts a lot. But I was like, don't you feel like he's we changed got his thoughts because he's got a freaking six pack busting out of the screen and he used to be a fatty and he lost 100 pounds on the keto down. He's a great example. It's like, oh, yeah, he used this tool to lose 100 pounds basically to save his life. That's why he's popular on YouTube. It's a compelling story. And now it's like he's, you know, ripped and shredded. Do you need to starve yourself of carbohydrates in that state? And he doesn't believe that anymore, right? Right. And, yeah. and he's, he's tweaking things. So is Mike Mutzel, who's a respected researcher yeah, and athlete Mike. himself. He's great. And so many people. Dr. Tommy Wood's been talking about Tommy this Wood's stuff great, with too. me for four or five years ago. He said, look, here's what I tell my healthy, active clients. Eat as much nutritious food as you possibly can until you gain a pound of body fat and then turn the dial back and that's where you know you're optimal. And that strongly counters this notion of getting metabolic efficiency where the fewer calories we can uh, you know, still feel good and, and thrive, the longer we're gonna live. And so these very prominent uh, spokespeople in favor of fasting and time-restricted feeding, Walter Longo, uh, Sachin Panda doing great work and you know, 
highly respected researchers, but I think there's a real life component here where I want to follow the guys in the super training gym that are turning 50 and 60 and 70 and still putting weight on their back and doing squatting and running out doing sprints. That I feel is my path to not only longevity, but health span and also enjoying the crap out of your life rather than just seeing how much can you fast and how little food can you eat so that you don't get a heart disease, cancer, and, uh, and, and premature death. So I think we have a fork in the road there that we mm-hmm. all have to reconcile. And in my personal reflections, it's like, wait, what am I doing? Um, I'm this crazy old guy trying to jump over the high jump bar. I need to go home and stuff my face. How, with how high incredible. can you high jump, by the way? Uh, this year I have five one. Uh, so you can um, almost jump over my head. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. My best ever is five four, and that was uh, seven years ago. You can jump over my dad. There you go. There you go. I jump over Sheldon. Yeah. I need to. You said something. You said uh, one of those catchphrases that me is is a is a lifelong fatty trying to do something about it, right? Uh, Leaky gut syndrome. I, I I go on one page on Instagram. That's all. That's be, that's bullshit. Another page. I hear it. I heard it in a documentary about ten years ago on Netflix. Which you know anything that's not you know it's disappeared yeah. with that. But what? Can you explain that a little bit? And, oh sure. Yeah. I mean, leaky gut syndrome is now one of the most popular emerging fields of medicine, and it's finally coming into mainstream. Like some of these things that have taken ten, fifteen, twenty years. Um, so now you could probably ask an MD and they'd have some awareness of it and, and think it's legit. And there's probably been conferences with people making presentations. But the, the idea is that when you get um, unwanted agents into your digestive tract, such as the natural plant toxins and such as the chemicals that are consumed with the processed foods, the industrial seed oils, the refined sugars and uh, uh, grains, things that we're not really meant to digest that aren't human foods, they aren't paleo, all those kind of things, you start to uh, inflame and damage the very delicate lining of your gut. It's called the microvilli. They're little fingers that allow certain particles in, the things that we're supposed to allow in, which are carbohydrates, protein, fat, uh, micronutrients, minerals, things like that, and then keep the other stuff out. So when your gut becomes uh, damaged, inflamed, and permeable, uh, the fingers are not working well. And then, this is a literal statement, shit gets into your bloodstream because that's what it is. It's waste from your food that's not supposed to be in your bloodstream. Shit gets into your bloodstream and it wreaks havoc upon your health. So the idea is that leaky gut syndrome is the, uh, the upstream cause of a lot of health problems, especially in the category of autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. So gastritis, colitis, uh, arthritis, sinusitis, uh, allergies, asthma, all these things are something uh, wrong with your immune response. Autoimmune is the body attacking itself. That's what the term means, right? And inflammatory, we're referring to chronic inflammation, not the sprained ankle that got swollen and then mm-hmm. feels better the next day, but it's just this low-grade level of inflammation that is trashing health. And if your digestive tract is not good, oh, you make 90% of your serotonin in your digestive tract, so it's going to have a direct impact on mental health. So healing that gut would be the first priority. And it kind of goes in the bigger category of like anyone who wants to drop excess body fat or has that goal first has to become healthy. Otherwise, it's just folly. It's just uh, destined for failure by cutting my carbs and working out more. All that stuff's going to be disastrously uh, disappointing results because you're not processing energy well in your body. And if you can't manufacture energy in the cellular, in your own cells, if you're not good at manufacturing energy internally, you're going to live on quick hits of sugar and quick energy to get through the day how does because you're not start, good at burning fat. How does somebody start that path of just getting healthy, just start consuming more nutrient Rich uh, well, I mean, where- first is get rid of every processed food and be strict and diligent about it. Um, we used to think it's like, hey, whatever matches your personality, maybe you cut back slowly and write it down and Just have a cheat meal one day. No, cold turkey, because your life's at stake, you have to get rid of the refined. The oils are number one, the refined grains and sugars are next. And if you realize how prevalent they are, you're throwing away a lot of stuff in your house and you're going to the restaurant going, uh, 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 there's not much. But of course there is. There's a tremendous yeah. culinary delight of uh, going and getting, uh, stocking up on steak, seafood, eggs, fruit, 
all that great stuff. You just need to learn what you can have. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's um, here it is. the offenders beyond that? Here, here it is. If you're taking notes, people, here's what you can have. This is the ancestral example. The, the number one study of all time is human evolution. We ate meat, fish, fowl, eggs, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds. That's our entire human diet. And now there's some modern things that are allowed, like well-chosen organic high-fat dairy and things like that. But it's really simple to honor our ancestral, our genetic expectations for health. And, of course, make the right choices because when we say meat today, I'm not talking about processed sausage in the frozen bag. I'm talking about going down to yeah. the, the co-op in Sacramento and getting the grass-fed beef and what, doing the best you can. You know, What are your thoughts since you've done so much studying on all this ancestral stuff and uh, figuring all this stuff out? What, it, what is your thoughts on dairy? Uh, Good, a lot bad, of people, indifferent? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people say that they don't do well on dairy. They react to dairy. And then you go can get your food allergies tested and you have all these different things. That could be an example of the downstream problem of not having a healthy gut. And then you're allergic to uh, uh, almonds and cucumbers and uh, this and that and all these things make you flare up. Well, if you healed yourself, maybe you'd be more resilient and you could have an occasional um, whatever. Yeah. How long does it turn around for the gut? If Say if... Say I, I cut out everything. How long does it, how many weeks before the gut starts oh to get Oh my gosh. Order? You know what I, I do is probably um, try to fast for as long as possible out of the gate on day one. And then when you can't stand it, you go eat something healthy and nutritious. And the, the animal based experimental period would be the best because you can enjoy yourself and have eggs and meat, but you're getting completely away from anything that's potentially problematic to the gut. And so if you stick to that for as long as possible, maybe 30 days, um, you could get a remarkable turnaround because finally, for the first time in your life, right, it's not months, it's years and decades of slamming the same stuff that caused the problem. Finally, your body gets to take a break and heal. And bone broth is known to have a heal and seal effect. So things that are high in collagen will help repair that gut lining. But probably there's nothing rivaling fasting for repair processes. There's some other things that, um, you know, you and I are both uh, customers of uh, Merrick Health, right? And oh my um, gosh. if you go, like Merrick Health, one of the things that um, people are talking a lot now for gut health, I don't know if you've heard about this, but um, BPC 157, which helps your joints a lot, it's a peptide, mm. helps uh, people's joints. And so mm. I kind of, I usually take it for that. But it um, also been shown in a lot of studies to like really heal the gut. And so uh, my dad had intestinal, intestinal permeability, mm -hmm. and I want him to get on that because I think that that's a, mm -hmm. a good way to go. Fantastic. Yeah, I, w I would go find a functional medicine expert that can do a personal program. And uh, Merrick Health is a great example because they can you can engage with them remotely yeah. in, in case you don't have someone magical in your own town, but they will do complete panels and look and see, hey, these numbers look out of whack and these are things that can help it. And um, while you're doing your best every single day to, for example, you know, cut, cut all the bad food out of your diet, yeah, get some intervention. It's totally, you know, it's, it can't hurt, whereas going to the mainstream medical system can definitely hurt. And I know people, family, extended family members where it's like, Ah, they're on more medication, they're yeah. doing it this way, they're doing it that way. Um, and then um, in one example, uh, my, my very good friend has, um, what do you call it, a uh, chronic um, um, you know, acid reflux, which is, can be a really bad thing because yeah, it can brutal. lead to esophageal cancer if it's chronic. And he's struggling, he's lost all this weight, he can't play sports, he can't live his normal lifestyle. And then later on in the conversation, 30 minutes later, like, oh, you know that donut place across the street from there? I, oh, that place is awesome. The pink ones with the sprinkles. I'm like, wait, are you telling me you're fucking eating donuts right now when you have this serious health condition that's, that's, that's life-threatening? I mean, it's, it's like you're at a fork in the road. Forget the donuts. And I know we have addictive properties to these foods, and it's yeah. really it's easy for me to yell it here in a conversation <laughs> then say you have to make a decision at some point like i can't eat those foods because they will that'll kill me i don't have free reign and free pass that maybe you know an athlete who just finished their in extremely intense workout can go and enjoy a donut if they if it really means something to them yeah so you're how old now 57 57 and you go so um what i found interesting we were talking about this the other day you use merrick health right but you don't use testosterone right 
No, Mark Bell asked me the same question. He's like, Brad, how come you're not on replacement therapy? I'm like, I don't know, Mark. Maybe so, I should be. <laughs> so what do they do when you go to Merrick Health and you don't get oh testosterone? Gosh, right. Do they go over a lot of stuff with you? Yeah, th this consultation is just, it's the most superior service I've ever come across. It is amazing. And so anyone listening, go on there. You probably have a link. I have Merrick yeah. Health slash Brad Kearns. We can, you it's can your use show, it. so it's Merrick no, Health. No, no, you can use Chris either Bell. one. It doesn't people. matter. We want to help you. We want you to feel better. I actually... I actually really love what Derek is doing. I love mm -hmm. Derek's channel, More Plates, More Dates. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan. I'm proud to be associated with them. I think they do such a great job. So uh, yes, this is a plug, but it's a, it's a good plug because <clears throat> it's the one thing I really, really believe in from day one um, when, when I did Bigger, Stronger, Faster uh, 15 years ago, I, I would always say, why can't you just go to a doctor? And mm -hmm. walk into a doctor and be like, am I healthy? Mm. Okay, I'm not healthy. What do I need? Yeah. You know, and why isn't this available? Yeah. And then we found people in Bigger, Stronger, Faster that did it, but they were all shady and we showed it. Like right. I went to a chiropractor who took my blood and right, and, and the guy was well-meaning and everything, but he wasn't a, uh, he wasn't a specialist yeah. in these specific hormones and things. Yeah. And so um, that's what you get at Merrick Health. You get people that have been doing this for a long time and working with you know, people for a long time. What did, what did you end up getting prescribed? Well, yeah, I should say- did you get uh, stuff? We're, we're, we're trying to distinguish between what's possible or normal and what's optimal. So that's really what appeals to me is like, I want someone looking at that report going, eh, this is a little low. I'd like to see your T3 and T4 increase a little bit because 90, 999 out of 1,000 doctors will go, wow, everything looks great. You're, uh, you're right in the normal range. Yeah, I don't want to be want... in the normal range because yeah. the normal range today is pathetic. The yeah. United States is the fattest and sickest population in the history of humanity. We have uh, two-thirds in a poor metabolic health condition. That's not a good ratio of two. You know, it, it's horrible. So, no. um, and that we were just good. over in Europe, and you just noticed that like people are— A little different, huh? There's not a lot of people that are really overweight yeah. there. It's, it's just a different scene. You yeah. Know? Yeah, so um, my numbers in terms of male hormone are pretty good still, or I'd say really good by comparison. But again, I'm going for optimal instead of really, I, I want to go from good to great all the time. And um, there's a good range, there's a good fluctuation. I think that in my case depends on my training practices and whether I'm overdoing it or not. So for me to optimize, first of all, I'm trying to optimize my training protocol so I perform and recover uh, sensibly. And then secondly, there's a lot of supplements they suggested and ways that I can get a little bit more free testosterone, a little bit of reduction in sex hormone binding globulin. I have enough serum testosterone to be declared uh, good to superior. And so we will talk <laughs> again. Like yeah, My levels yeah. are superior. It's, it's between really good and superior. I had, a, I had a serum T level last year of 1008 which is off the charts wow. it's 99 percentile for a young man that's great let alone and then uh another time i had 563 which is still good or quite good for 57 but that's like half of my best so that fluctuation is dramatic a lot of times i'm in the 700s 800s 650 750 860 590 so i'm i'm, I'm doing well but we will talk again in one year How and your... five years and whenever, however many years. Because when that day comes, when I'm sleeping like a champ, like I always do, I'm eating exceptionally well, I'm training sensibly, and I'm looking at this downward slide. I'm not opposed to like modern science coming in as a substitute, you know, yeah, on the out. soccer field, the sub. Here comes the sub. You only got a few subs in, in soccer. Yeah. So I'm going to take one of those subs. Uh, when I'm 63 instead of 57, for example. That's great. What, what, how was your, um, well, first of all, how do you feel of um, about cholesterol as a marker and how was your cholesterol? Uh, they, they said that um, they'd like to see some of those numbers a little lower, but the people I follow and respect highly, like pa Paul Saldino, Kate Shanahan, Dr. Ron Sinha, they really want you to focus on triglycerides to HDL sure. ratio. And if you have an That's why I ask, because it yeah. seems like there's two camps. Right. It seems like the people will say that, like, it seems like the Lane Nortons of the world will say the Paul Saladinos are crazy for mm. you, for you, like, having such a high cholesterol, right? Like, so I don't know if those specific people battle it out, but like, there's yeah. a lot of people battling back and forth. Like, yeah. these guys say it's okay. And then I read Dr. Spencer Nadalski going, you guys are crazy thinking mm. that a cholesterol that high is actually mm. good for you, right? Mm -hmm. And so I like to split the difference. So what I was actually oh. happy with <laughs> is that um, on my last blood test, my cholesterol was like below, my total cholesterol was below 200 for the uh -huh. first time sort uh -huh. of ever. And nice. that was simply with a drug called azetamibe. I don't uh -huh. know if you ever heard of that. No. It's a non-statin drug. 
supposedly with very few side effects. I looked up uh, the information on it and didn't really find anything, um, you know, dangerous about it. And so my cholesterol, like, it just makes me feel better knowing that my cholesterol's <laughs> good. You've been programmed, your brain's been programmed by yeah, mainstream but, medicine but for I don't know 50 who's years. Right. The, the problem is, like, yeah, yeah. I don't know who's right and who's well, wrong you know, and how Chris, am I supposed to be equipped? It's, it's no big deal. It's just a matter of life or death. Yeah. So. You know, with cholesterol, I think if your triglycerides are low, you're probably good. But who knows? HDL high, triglycerides low. You want to shoot for a one to one ratio there. My HDL yeah. was like 98 the last time I got my. Yeah, that's, you know, it was off like, the charts. That's excellent. what they said. They were yeah. like, how is your HDL so high? I'm like, yeah. I don't know. I eat a lot of meat. Exercise and liver. saturated fat is how you raise HDL for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah it's, it'd be nice to think that if we're talking about this stuff and if the listener is super interested in looking up their own, um, we're at, you know, we're at level nine talking about trying to get to level 10. Yeah. And if, if you're listening and you still have those Oreo treats in your diet and you have habits and absent minded behaviors where um, a 7-Eleven Slurpee is still in the mix, is still on your charge card. You know, I, I, I monitor my, my daughter's uh, use uh -oh. of, the, uh, of the card. I'm like, wait a second, 7-Eleven, there ain't mm. nothing good in there that's, if you spent more than three bucks, I want to know what the hell's going on because I'm not supporting that. I don't yeah. care if you're a college student or not. Yeah, so um, it's, it's there really going isn't for the... really is anything good in 7-Eleven besides water, right? Um, they do they have, have, they have bananas. They have a basket of bananas. That's true. Bananas. Yeah. Peanuts? No. no peanuts. Not really. Peanuts would be eh. in the legume category rather than the nut category. And so it's, the peanuts know, are as off we the know, team. it's highly allergenic. Off Unless, hey, if you have no problem and you get a quality, fresh ground peanut butter uh, and you enjoy that and it's important to you and it keeps you away from Ben and Jerry's and the true garbage, we have to take a triage approach here sometimes, I think, because... Um, man, we've given a lot of live conferences, presentations. We used to host a retreat uh, every year and talk to real people and understand their problems and connect after writing all these books to nobody. You know, like, who, or I'm doing a podcast, I'm in my closet, yeah. uh, much smaller than this room. So I love the expansive space oh, studio you space. built here. I was telling you, I don't have yeah, much yeah. space in here. But it's like, you got to connect with real people and see what's going on and, and you know, look at their faces and, and realize the day-to-day -day challenges. And that's when you go, man, Th we got to take five steps backwards here. That's and, where the modifications you know, came in with the diets was like for Mark and I was like, um, yeah, in practice, like just have a steak on a plate every meal, you know, do a steak fast, eat a steak, you know, eat a steak till you get hungry again, eat another steak. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, that's so easy to tell somebody. Mm -hmm. But then when you're dealing with somebody like every day, like, how'd you do yesterday? They're like, ah, oh, not too good. Like, <laughs> you know, had a steak and then had, the, you know, had a burrito because I couldn't, yeah. didn't, didn't want another steak or whatever. Yeah. And so we just find in practice that it wasn't working that great. <laughs> and that's why we just decided to like add fruit into it because mm. it seemed like, oh, there's two sides to things, right? There's sweet and savory. Mm -hmm. Well, you have the sweet with the fruit, the savory. It sort of takes care of all the huh. taste that you yeah, need and point. you're done. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and speaking of that and going back to that talk about how um, these practices like keto and fasting are inherently stressful, um, that might not be a good thing, even for someone who is struggling with poor metabolic health, excess body fat, and all these things where we've been programmed our whole life to say, I just got to eat less food. And um, this, this population has been uh, characterized as lazy and undisciplined. And the great work of authors like Gary Tabbs, where he says in the book, uh, Why We Get Fat is the title, he says, um, gluttony and sloth are not the causes of obesity, they are the symptoms. So people who have poor metabolic health, excess body fat, whatever, they're tired and they're hungry. It's not that they're uh, 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 lazy and undisciplined. When a human is hungry, the human's gonna eat. So that's when we gotta back up seven steps and get healthy first before any other thing is presented. And the way to do that is to eliminate processed foods. And then once you've done that, turn your attention to the nutrient dense foods, like you guys are talking about the steak for a snack. These are things that keep us on track and keep us highly satisfied. And if you have to overdo it or play games or do uh, tips and tricks to stay on track, all that stuff's great. Just like you talk about cycling through, now I'm doing this, now I'm doing that, now I'm adding fruit. All those things are gonna be like A plus in the class versus someone who is aimless, doesn't have the direction, uh, is afraid to like, 
take baby steps instead of this grand sweeping change. Like, that's it. I'm going home after listening to this show, and I'm going to cut out every single thing for the rest of my life. That might be daunting and overwhelming because the next time you go out to dinner and the, 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 the dessert tray comes over and the waitress says, can I tempt you uh, with one of these? And you're like, yeah, you can tempt me. Okay, I'll have that one because it's programmed. It's your whole life. Yeah. So if we can make like little tiny victories each day and get a little better... This sounds like Mark now, where he's yeah. always emphasizing that point. You know, a little step is a, is a huge win. So fast for one meal, and then guess what? Your next meal is going to be way more satisfying. You're going to have a much higher level of consciousness, mindfulness about what you're eating, and you're going to appreciate it more than walking by, you know, the, the front counter at work and grabbing another caramel candy because someone put it there. So you were you talking before a little bit about like you said, you don't think it's good to fast, and then you just talked about fasting. So when do you think fasting is applicable? When should people use it? When you're trying your, to. What's when your kickoff? When yeah. and how? In, when, implementation for fasting. When you're trying to get out of that hole, it's a great tool because fasting. So again, will like keep another you, intervention almost. It's right? an intervention yeah. because it'll keep you away from the shitty breakfast that you have, and it'll. Uh, by default, reduce your excess caloric intake, um, and so the, and then it'll, it'll give you all these uh, uh, health boosting, immediate kicking into uh, anti-inflammatory, autoimmune, gut repair, all that great stuff. Um, so I'm talking like if you're a healthy, active person looking to experience peak performance and, and live a long life, and you've already done all that hard work and you have a clean diet, that's when I'm reflecting personally. But I think we're hitting a lot of people with this message now, where there's a lot of people that are really deep into it, the CrossFit community, um, the female uh, endurance or strength training uh, participant who has way different metabolic needs than the male and way more sensitivity to hormones. Uh, reproductive fitness is the deepest biological drive of the human. So when the male's libido is dropping, you can tell right now there's something wrong with your diet or your athletic training. It's not a throwaway thing because uh, I've been really preparing for this contest and so my libido has dropped. That's a, that's a bad sign. And in the, in the extreme for the female endurance or or high-performing athlete that gets body fat below a certain threshold, they experience loss of menstruation, amenorrhea. And that is a hugely health-destructive phenomenon. And um, it's time to turn the corner and fix something there. Yeah, that's interesting you say that because um, I was talking to Mark about this the other day. I said, like, I think actually, um, so my testosterone levels have, have always been like on the low side. Um, because, and, and I think maybe it was because I had an opioid addiction for like six years and that can really kill things. I don't, I don't know. They were just, they were always have been kind of low, Yeah. but I have a feeling and I'm, I want to experiment with this probably like after I turn 50, which is in a couple months, but, um, I'm trying to get in the best shape of my life until then. And then after I turn 50, maybe I'll give this a shot. But what I wanted to try to do is actually go off of testosterone and see like, well, why wouldn't my body come back to normal? Yeah. Like what, what did I do any long lasting damage? Like yeah. probably not. And I eat so much healthier than I did when I was an opioid addict eight uh -huh. years ago, 10 years ago, you know? And so I want to see if that will actually come back. Cause I think like, I look at people like yourself and I'm like, well, he's not on testosterone. Like I, I don't want to be on it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I don't, I don't yeah. want to need it, yeah. but I use it because my levels are low, but yeah. are my levels were my levels yeah, low? Yeah, which came first? Were my know? levels low from all the crap I was putting in my body? Yeah. And I was drinking alcohol. I was an alcoholic too. Yeah. So, I mean, all these things, was it, was it low because of that? Good job talking about it years later and cleaning up, man. That's a huge well, accomplishment. It's one of the greatest accomplishments of humanity, and we, we don't give it enough credit. We celebrate oh, the guy who it. set the record with the weights on the back. But, like, man, you know, the stats are not good. You probably know that. No, they're not good at the, all. Not the, for opioids. Um, your, your fellow addicts that you attended rehab with, you're, you're looking around, looking at, you know, one in a hundred success story, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, um, I found myself uh, being friends with a lot of people I went to rehab. Like, you get really close to people. Yeah. And I'd be yeah. really close. You're not to supposed to date, though. No, I no, I didn't, I didn't date anybody. But I was really close to people for about nine months afterwards, maybe mm. a year afterwards. And then I find found out that like people wouldn't call you back, and it went, and so you know you know what's going on. They're going back out again, yeah. and so like you said, I think you sometimes you have to just separate yourself from that and going like I can't, I can't be in this world anymore. Yeah. So I actually stepped out of that and just said like I, I'm just not gonna really wow. deal with anybody that I went to rehab with because 
unless they're doing what right. I'm doing. Unless they're totally because it's scary. Coming because in it's at, like, at the four a.m. workout club at Super Training, then yeah. you can be friends with them. And and yeah. I'll help anybody that comes to me or anybody that asks yeah. me. But I also don't want somebody pulling me down with them. You know, <laughs> that's that's easy to get pulled into. So interesting point because yeah, all that stuff surely um, tanked your hormone levels among other things in your body, right? But like, why couldn't you uh, clean the slate? And I guess you're supposed to wean off, or I don't know how that works, but like if you go in there and pick up weights, it's going to help your your hormone levels. Oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah. you might have to take a few plates off for six months. I don't know what, what it would be like if you went off well, supplement. You, you'd need some time to kick back into gear. It's actually interesting. I wasn't on testosterone for a long time, like before I just I just started up recently again, and I wasn't on it for a long time before and I was like I was just as strong or stronger than I've ever been at that point too so you know I didn't like I'm on TRT and I know people aren't going to believe me but I didn't really get any stronger you know like huh. it doesn't do what's crazy so I take about 150 milligrams a week yeah. and it doesn't do all these crazy things that people like think you're just going to get on TRT and all of a sudden you're going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger and yeah. it doesn't do that. It's a slow grind. You know, it's a low, it's well, a low it's dosage. Well, because you're doing it in a therapeutic manner, like in the movie and, and the public perception of, of doping is you get superhuman freaks, but those guys are largely abusing the They're drug. They're doing superhuman like the, amounts. The females yeah. that are setting world records um, with you know rippling muscles, they're not doing therapeutic dose. They're getting jacked off their ass so that they can you know set a record that that lives forever. You know, I always try to um, do things fast and quick. And Mark always told me like, hey, if you want to get really really lean, it's like stealing sand from the beach. You got to do it like when nobody's looking. You just <laughs> a little a little bit at a time. You know, just uh -huh. a little bit at a time. Like you don't need you don't want to drop ten pounds in a month. You want to go like a little bit at a time, a little mm -hmm. bit at a time. And um, what's funny is, although I've tried to go those fast methods, I found out that like this is a really a long grind to stay in the shape that you're in, huh. that Mark's in. Like I'm not as lean as you or Mark, but I want to get there. Yeah. And I realize like how hard it is and how much it takes to actually get there and you know and stay there. It's pretty hard. Um. Yeah, I think so. Do you find it yeah. difficult? Uh, I I don't I don't find it difficult. Like like. You know, many other people would would say it's it's pretty difficult because, um, you know, these temptations and things like indulgent foods. I've kind of convinced myself that I, I don't need them and it's not that big a deal, and I prefer to just stay on this healthy path. So I'm I'm not tempted. And the same thing with like my morning exercise routine, which I love talking about because it's a new thing. It's been going for five and a half years. I've not missed a single day. What is that? Oh my gosh, it's um, <laughs> you know, it's a pretty involved sequence of exercises. And I started out doing this because I was kind of getting beat up from my most difficult workouts of the week, my sprinting and jumping workouts. And I'd feel great. I'd go to the track. I'd put up some times. And then like the next three days, I'd be limping around the house because my calves were torn up. My hamstrings would always cramp up or, or get injured. And so I realized that I didn't approximate the challenge of the hard workout any other time during the week because you can't you can't go sprint every day no, i was just telling are. mark this like what if i tried every day i'm like no no your, your body will get the impact trauma is huge so i was doing like whatever weight training uh jogging i was keeping in shape i was doing all these different things but i wasn't approximating the challenge of sprint workout so i thought what if i got up every day and did some strengthening and mobility flexibility drills that would help condition my hamstrings to prepare for sprint workouts. So I, I started this little uh, this little session. It took 12 minutes at first, and it was swinging my legs in the air and doing uh, bicycle kicks and, and crunches and uh, working the hamstring through range of motion. And it was really nothing, but it, it made me feel better, and I, I was better adapted to the workouts. And so what happened was this thing crept its way into the category of habit in my life. So I knew as soon as I got up, I would hit the deck and I'd go to work and it would be over with quick and I'd go on with my day. Um, but I loved it so much and it had these other peripheral benefits like it improved my focus, motivation, discipline, resiliency against distraction of other forms of life because I knew I was doing this. You could count, I could count on myself, no one cared. I could count on myself that I did this every single day. And I started to talk about it in public and say, I got a streak going now. I've been doing this every day for a whole year, two years, three years. Now it's How five and a half years. Now, it started at 12 minutes. It was pretty easy. My original videos on YouTube where I'm like, look at me, I'm kicking my leg up here, and then I'm doing side to side. Now it's 40, which is a big commitment. And the degree of difficulty 
because I add things. You know, I addition a new exercise that I think might be important, and I very carefully add it to the template. But the template is the exact same every day. So it's like a meditative. I don't need creative energy. Like, what workout am I going to do yeah, this you just morning? Roll right into it. It's like brushing my teeth. Yeah, it's in that same category. Of brushing my teeth. Do you have it's, those online? Can people watch those? Yeah, I have a whole course on my website. Thank you for asking, Brad. So, what's your website? Bradkerns.com. Bradkerns.com. You can sign up for this online course. Yeah, K E A R N S. You'll find me now. That's what's so good about Google and Google Maps. Um, but I teach people a bunch of different options because you're not going to want to model mine right out of the gate because I've made it to uh, a point where it's too it, advanced, feels, it feels easy and sustainable to me. Yeah. And I don't mind that 40-minute commitment because I've built my lifestyle around it. That's how important it is for me. Um, but yeah, the degree of difficulty is pretty tough. I took my buddy through it who's pretty fit and he quit halfway. And I'm like, oh, is this hard? Fuck yeah, it's hard. I go, it's not hard for me because I do it every yeah, day. Doing it every day. But it is, you know, if I tried it five years ago, I would have been blown out too. My stomach's burning. I quit. And so for everyone listening, what you want to do is like make a commitment. I think first thing in the morning is vastly superior to any other time of day because it's really showing that you're in control of your life. And put it at five minutes at first. So the first five minutes of your day, Maybe it's leash up your dog and walk the dog around the block because the dog deserves it, even if you're not motivated or it's cold or it's snowing. I love when my dog sees the snow outside the window and is like, let's go. What are we yeah. waiting for? I'm like, we're waiting for the snow to stop. No, no, no. Just get things done. Don't make excuses and make it simple and doable and sustainable. So that's why I say give a five-minute yeah. commitment at first. Then it might build into a seven and a nine because you're doing this and doing that. So that's what happened to me. I, I stumbled into... Finally, a 40-minute routine. Now, am I going to keep increasing it? Absolutely not. I will never make it longer because I don't want to tiptoe into that direction of like, ah, this is now starting to get me now stressed because I hour. have a busy morning yeah. and I can't commit to it anymore and I'm going to now start doing negotiating in my mind. Now it's like I don't think of anything else. I don't reach for the phone, which 84% of Americans do. The first act upon awakening is reach for the mobile device. And the behavior psychologists assert that once you reach for that instant gratification and that distractibility and those intermittent variable rewards, that's the term. It's like a slot machine. It's an addiction because you don't know what's on your social media feed yeah. or on your text messages. And that's what makes it so special. If you get the same text every morning from uh, from a Aunt Susie and says, well, I love you, Christopher. You're a <laughs> wonderful uh, nephew. You're like, all right, thanks. Same to you. But it's different. It's new. There's something exciting. And our brains love that type of stimulation. But once you reach for the phone, it's very difficult to recover. Uh, psychologist Nicole Bender, Benders Hadi says, once you, once you get into that mindset, you'll never recover. Huh. So now you lost your ability to like craft a to-do list with prioritize green stars for these and gold stars for those and think about your life and sip your coffee and write in your gratitude journal or whatever is a great thing to do in the morning. I think getting physical and getting the blood flowing is fantastic. And so that's why I, I'm a favor of a morning exercise routine. But boy, it, it's been life-changing for me. And I say that coming from Mr. Athlete Guy, where fitness is a huge part of my life. I'm not needs to improve. I'm not thinking about, gosh, I got to yeah. get in shape this year. It's been a bad run you know, in my 50s. That's all handled at the real workouts. But this is a whole different category than my actual workout patterns. And so that's where I think the magic is for anybody, even an athlete or even an unfit person who's like, yeah, that sounds like an easy way for me to make a foray into a more active lifestyle where this gym's different because you guys are so welcoming. But like even walking into a gym, talking yeah. about getting that perspective, people walk through the first front door of the gym. They start to get an emotional response. They start to get nervous, anxiety. They're scared. They get one uh, odd look or one trainer who has a workout that's too hard for them. And they start to go, you know, put their tail between their legs. And that's something we got to break out of yeah. and realize that fitness is within our grasp anytime, anywhere. What, um, We'll, we'll let you go here because we've been talking forever. But what drives you? Because you're a really interesting guy. You do um, marathon or uh, you do uh, triathlons. Used to. Used, used to do to. triathlons. I'm a, I am a recovering done, endurance you've athlete. You've done high jump. And my favorite thing that I always bring up whenever I see you is you're, I believe, the world champion in speed golf. I have a Guinness World Record. Guinness World Record yeah. in speed yeah. golf, which is yeah. amazing where you hit the ball and then you sprint to the next hole. Well, 
the actual sport of speed golf, and we have competitive tournaments. I've been top 20 in the world championships five times, and it's really fun. It's a nice, it's tight community. You play the course. They keep your score like a real golf tournament, but they also time you. And so they add your minutes and your strokes together. Each one counts for a point, and you get a total score. So I'm a pretty good player. My best tournament score is 125, which is a 78 in 47 minutes. So I'm shooting in the wow. 70s. I'm playing good golf, but I'm running along. I only have five clubs. I have a tiny little bag, and I'm running to the next shot. Or, or you know, pacing. I'm not sprinting, but you have to play 18 holes, which is about five miles. And boom, the tournament's over. It's great. You go out to breakfast. You go to work. That's what's so great about speed golf. It doesn't take all day to go play golf. <laughs> but my, my wow. world record is um, there's an offshoot of the fastest single hole of golf ever played. And it has to be 500 yards, which isn't long, a par five if you're familiar with golf. So 500 yards is more than a quarter mile. It's a long hole. And they start the clock, and you run as fast as you can because you're only playing one hole. And, boy, that was a super fun challenge. I focused on it. I prepared for months. So you play months. one hole, and you, yeah. you hit the ball. You run to the ball? Sprint, sprint the ball. as fast as you can. And then you Unlike hit it. Unlike the tournament and, that and I then described. And you just ready yourself quick and then hit it again? Yeah, and it's like even catching your breath, you don't have time to do that. So I'm, I'm like, you gotta be sweat is dripping shot. from my eyes. I can't even see the ball clearly. And I'm heaving my chest from sprinting a 400 meter all out. And you just got to swing and trust it. And your natural athletic instinct takes over. It's so fun. And you can see on, on YouTube, I have the world record uh, performance. I basically got a birdie on a par five while sprinting and playing the hole in a minute 38 seconds. It's and amazing. so it really was like a miracle because it was like I was so far in the zone because I was so tired and running so fast that I just allowed the club to swing itself and I hit four great shots in a row. That's how you make a birdie, right? Yeah. And I only had one club. That's how I beat the previous record is the other guy had a little bag and he was fussing with getting the right club out when oh, he was near the smart. green. Yeah, yeah. So I trained for five months with just a three wood to hit chip shots and putts and shorter shots with a three wood, three wood, three this guy's wood. Got so a everything strategy going in. Yeah, I love yeah. It. Um, now he's pulling it up on the screen. I guess if you're watching on YouTube, uh, don't worry. I won't ask much of your time because the whole, the entire thing takes a minute thirty-eight to play the hole. So <laughs> that's another watch good. Watch it real fast. If what you, do you think? If yeah, let's watch it. If you guys are inclined, we, we can always uh, edit. It's got it good heavy to. metal um, uh, background music to get people pumped. All right, 2018. That's not that long ago. Yeah. So 53 years old. I got on board with Guinness World Record. That was um, that was fun. This is great. Yeah, I'd already yeah. be dead. <laughs> unlike, unlike a tournament, if you watch me in a tournament, I'm running like a steady pace. And this is full sprint because I'm going to collapse after one hole. And um, a totally different sport, right? You know what song that is? Slave to the S Grind. Slave to the Grind by Skid Row. Of course. Rock. Yeah. Of course. I didn't know if you know it. That's great. Um, so, man, man, you got how far did you hit that ball? Uh, so this is a 500 yard hole. So, you're so hitting I'm hitting about 400 you know, or two, It's about 240 with the three wood. Here goes the three wood again. So now I'm, you know, if I'm other, another 240, that's 480. I'm almost up to the green, and now is where the um, the pressure comes because I'm I'm getting really tired, and I have to hit this perfect touch shot with the wrong club. To this get is it in close LA? to the hole. Yeah, this is in LA. Is that Universal or something in the background? Yeah, yeah. You see the yeah. uh, Universal City. This is Woodley Golf Club in the San Fernando Valley, my hometown. So it was cool. And to apply for a record, you're going to see in the video my, my support crew there. The, the standards are very stringent. You have to have 10 people witness your attempt, two timers, a filmmaker, a still photographer. So wait, you set up all these Wow, you people. set up and hit it within like. Yeah, you five got five seconds. Just well, one club, one like or not two even. seconds. One it's like a couple yeah. seconds. Yeah. So now here comes the money. Seconds, here right? comes the money putt, and um, that's pretty close. That's a pretty good shot. Wow! And Taking you got no make time that at all. <laughs> yeah. That was fantastic. amazing. Good for you. Yeah, thank you. That was that was a, that was a crazy to take a chance on that putt because you didn't look like you were ready. Oh no! You're no, like it's, boom. You're it's like, all. Um, it's you know you you can't take any time. But then if you're messing around and hit one bad shot, you're cooked. Yeah. And the other thing is Guinness allows you to make multiple attempts. But I realized with a previous uh, attempt that the first one I'm running the fastest. 
So if I go back, even if I take a five minute, 10 minute break, I go back, I'm going to be slower. I'm not a machine where I can run 400 meter sprint at the same time. So up here in Sacramento, when I attempted my second attempt, the shots were way better. I almost made the green in two shots, but I was exhausted and uh, I came up there and missed the putt. And I was like, gosh, I would have broke the record. And my timer's like, no, you were so much slower to the green that it didn't even matter that you hit two beautiful shots. So it's like, it's an all or nothing one shot deal. And to just bring, to wrap it up into a bigger picture, like here I am doing this goofy stuff at 53, but to me, it meant the same. It had the same significance as when I was racing on the pro circuit and getting on ESPN and winning the big giant check. We and, had this and, argument you know, being before. Being a pro athlete. Oh, this, we had this you, argument right, before. Think, yes, go ahead. Um, so it, what, what is a bigger accomplishment? <laughs> yeah. being, the, being third uh, ranked in the world as a triathlete. Because we were looking at your, your Wikipedia. First, in your uh -huh. first athletic career. Uh -huh. or, or being the world record holder. In, in in this event, where where do you, in your hierarchy what's, what's of better? accomplishments? Yeah, that's a great question. And even for example, jumping over the high jump bar, and I'm in an empty high school stadium that I had to sneak into for two years because of COVID, <laughs> and and throw my high jump standards over the fence. You know the things that hold yeah. the bar because everything's gone. And when I clear that height, I will scream like I've just won the Olympic gold. <laughs> and the sensation inside my body in this empty stadium is the exact same as crossing the finish line, winning the Coke Grand Prix in Las Vegas in 1991 when I was at the top of the triathlon scene. And so um, to compare and contrast, I guess I would have to admit when you dedicate your whole life to training and that's your essence. And, and I think a lot of ways you form your identity as a young person. Like that was my peak yeah. at age 25. And my fellow competitor, Andrew McNaughton, that I trained and raced with for a long time, he said, yeah, this is great. Like when we we're at the top of our game, he says, one thing we're going to have to face is that nothing we ever do in our career will match mm. crossing the finish line and winning an international competition. And I'm like, you're right. You can coach 100 Olympic champions, but it's, it's a different category than being at your absolute peak and doing your best. But if you uh, put that in a drawer and never again put yourself on the line, that's when you're missing out on life. You still and gotta chase the juice. Right? Yeah, we have so, so many that people is, that are telling their it. stories. Back in the day, our fo high school yeah. football team was undefeated yeah. while watching the NFL on Sunday. Yeah. Go ahead, watch the NFL, do your fantasy league, whatever, tell your stories. But let's turn that into something. I don't care if it's running a 5K, which is not as exciting as being undefeated championship team. But it's got to be something that puts you out of your comfort zone. Liver so King says, do something that scares the shit out of you every day. Yeah. That kind of mentality, I think, is super valuable and super important, especially for old-time jocks. Now, calibrate it appropriately. Keep your perspective healthy. Because when I played adult league basketball in the suburbs here in Sacramento, I was going up against guys that thought – they were in the NBA Finals because they had this that. misplaced and competitive intensity. And I remember my one of my favorite interactions was this big guy that I had to guard. I'm 5'11", 163, and I was guarding a guy who was maybe 6'1", 6'2", 215, just solid as a rock. And the guy was abusing me all up and down the court, right? And But he kept putting his elbow into my back to, like, get a rebound or, you know, drive by me with this, you know, foul foul play. And I finally said, I just got to play harder. And so next time uh, I try to box him out, I'm really going to you know, assert my position. And what happened was I caught my feet onto his on the gym floor, and he fell like a brick down to the ground. Like, you know, it was a major fall because when you, get, <laughs> when you pin people both feet, they go down. Yeah. And he jumps up, and he gets six inches from my face, and he says, man, I'm going to break your fucking neck. And I'm like, no, you're not, because I'm old, I'm not that good, and you're way bigger than me, and we're in the D1 league. The basketball leagues in town go A, B, C. You know, A, a league is for former college players. Yeah. You can go yeah, to Cal yeah, Fit, yeah. and there's an A league, and these guys yeah, are yeah, yeah. dunking on you and doing windmill dunks. The D1 <laughs> league is for guys like me yeah. who are trying to have fun and learn how to dribble through the legs. And I, I took him down immediately from hot temperature, and I shook hands, and I go, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. I'm trying my hardest. He's like, all right, just don't do it again. All right, all right. But um, that, I'm saying this because when we get it out of hand and it starts to, like a lot of endurance athletes overtakes their, their middle-aged life 
and they're so important and they're snapping to their partner in the parking lot like I told you to bring my other goggles too you know where are they and it's like dude this ain't the Olympics yeah. calm down Ask your wife if she can uh, go get a coffee and take some time off for herself and then pick you up later. You know, keep it, keep it real. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm keeping it real there. Um, I'm, you know, I, I know it's just fun and games, but to me, inside, that's the important thing. And it's like, I'm, you know, I'm never going to give so up. So that kind of answers the question. What drives yeah. you is you're competitive like crazy. Well, um, I think there's other people that are off the charts. So I, I never thought <laughs> that way about myself. And like, I raced and trained with the best athletes in the world. And they're, they're truly like, freaks of nature that have to win and Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant and the best guys on the triathlon circuit. And I was always striving to be more balanced with my perspective. And like Roger Bannister, the first uh, person to ever break four minutes yeah. in a mile, he had a great quote and he says, um, when you're performing, when you're doing athletics, um, nothing else in the world matters. But when you're finished, the idea is to file it away in a place that's generally not very important. And I tell like young athletes that I coach that where uh, don't kid yourself and say, uh, you know, my friend's daughter is an elite gymnast and we were trying to give her the right thing so she doesn't get too nervous. Hey, pretend nationals are just another meet. No, 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 no. You don't say nationals are just another meet because we freaking flew on an airplane here, got a hotel. Everything's about your yeah. little balance beam. It's not just another meet. It's very, very important. You've worked very hard. There's a lot of pressure. Face that, accept it. But as soon as you're done, Pack it you away. file it away yeah. and you go and have popcorn and bubble gum with your friends and um, carry on with life. Unplug and from it. That's the essence of, the, I think, the highest level of athletic excellence and athletic experience. You know Jim Lohr that writes all the yeah. mental training books? He says Steph Curry is the best example of the ideal athlete mindset. And that's because you watch him all game long. He's sticking his tongue out. He's having fun. He's doing his loosey-goosey shimmy, and it's the fourth quarter of the NBA Finals, and he's still flicking the shot up with this really loose wrist and this completely, uh, you know, perfectly focused uh, disposition where the pressure isn't getting to him. He's experimenting and throwing a crazy pass, and everybody goes, oh, bad pass. Why was he hot-dogging it, doing that? But he's playing all the time with this incredible freedom and flow, and that's how you get to be the best in the world. And I think we... We got to look at that more so than like the badass, like the guy that wanted to kick my ass on the basketball court during the D1 game. We don't need that type of juice. We need someone who's in the flow and, and, and loving the experience and celebrating a great performance by a competitor rather than, you know, getting all posturing. Yeah, it's hard not to let that become your life. You know, I was a power lifter all growing up. And I went to teenage nationals and, wow. you know, I, I came in third place there and that's in the entire country, you know, so I'm beating people left and right. But then when my hips started going, yeah. when I was in my early twenties, um, I remember just having a ton of pain all the time and having to stop powerlifting. And to mm -hmm. me, it was, it was weird because I was at USC film school oh, yeah. and USC has the best film school in the entire country. Yeah. It's really hard to get in. Yeah. And I didn't even look at that as an accomplishment because I had to stop powerlifting. And I was so upset that I had to stop powerlifting that like, I didn't feel like doing much anymore. Like yeah. it, it really was a, uh, depressing because i should have just been you know what i'm at the best film school in the world i should just have fun and yeah. do what i do here and whatever yeah. but like i was so focused on and maybe just because how we grew up you know me and my mm -hmm. brothers sort of grew up and we loved lifting so much that when it uh got taken away from me i felt like you know i didn't have anything left which is like a terrible way to look at like yeah it's rough you remember the documentary way to gold um the, starring Michael saw. Phelps. It's called Weight oh, okay. of Gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they interview yeah, a bunch yeah. of ex-athletes and how much trouble they have dealing with the post-Olympic letdown. Even 23 gold medal guy yeah. is talking about how he really fell apart. And yeah. It was tough. And then the people that fail or the people that succeed, it's just like this massive letdown because like now what's next? What am I going to – what's going to top there's that? There's nothing this after goes it. Beyond <laughs> <the places laughs> too, people get their degrees and then there's like this post-accomplishment mm. – like mm -hmm. withdrawal, yeah. right? I yeah. Watched. Yeah. My my best friend um, played basketball, and he played for um, University of Michigan. Nice. And he played wow. right after the fat. His name's Leland. Played right after the Fab Five. Uh -huh. And his biggest problem was that when he played basketball and he was in high school, he was in the newspaper every day. And then he went off to Michigan, and he did really. He was doing really well there. But then they got in trouble with the NCAA. So then he moved to mm -hmm. Providence, and he was doing really good at Providence. And then he broke his back. Oof. And after he broke his back, he ended up trying out for the NBA and he made a team for like the first 10 days or whatever, wow. but then he got cut. 
Yeah. And then after he got cut from there and knew it was like all over, he just had no idea what to do with his life. Like yeah. it, it's really sad because yeah. he was like my best friend and I just watched him go downhill from, you know, drinking a lot and, <laughs> and doing things that he shouldn't be doing um, because he sort of lost himself as an athlete mm-hmm. and we would talk about it a lot. And I remember like one time uh, sitting on the couch and it was really sad. I was like, he was my roommate at the time and he's he's like, He's like, hey, boar. I go, what? He goes, I don't know what to do. And I go, why not? He goes, I'm not the man anymore. Mm-hmm. And it was just really sad. It was like, yeah. that was my best friend. He's like, I'm yeah. not the man anymore. He's six foot eight, 280 pounds, could bench press 315 for like 15 reps any day. Wow. He's just a mutant, big, He's big He's going to get rebounds off me too. Yeah, I mean, he can get rebounds off anybody. But, you know, like I see that as like, uh, he he's probably he's doing a, a lot better now, but it's sad to see somebody, you know, sort of go downhill like that. Yeah, it's an example when they of, have so um, much potential to do other stuff too. He's a huge, good-looking guy, you know. Like, yeah. hey, you still have potential. Yeah, you got to leverage those peak performance attributes in all directions, and some athletes do that really well, and some don't. And yeah, it's really rough to see. But like winding that back, like why was it so important to be the man? You're the best basketball player on the court, but let that go as soon as the game's over and then you can kind of keep your perspective what was really great about my experience in the triathlon circuit was like one day i was on top and then the next day someone's going to kick my ass and i'm going to be flying home from australia in the in the cargo section feeling sorry for myself and exhausted because you have to train so hard and you're on that fine line where i was kind of inconsistent where i you know i'd I'd win or I'd get my ass kicked. I, I wasn't like the guy that you could count on to be third every time. Yeah. And so it was this huge roller coaster. And after a while, like you get sick of the roller coaster and you get over yourself. That was the original name of my podcast. I changed I it to that, be yeah. read. But um, the importance of getting over yourself cannot be understated. It's just the secret to life to, to realize like you're allowed to compete with great competitive intensity, but get over yourself while you're doing it. File the, uh, the, the results away. Even if you're a rich motherfucker, as my friend likes to call rich motherfuckers, because he is a rich <laughs> person, but not a motherfucker. Anyway, it doesn't make you superior to the next person. And a lot of people would be better served to getting over themselves. You know Mark Manson, the author of uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, yes, best-selling I book? Yes, I love that book, yeah. He says, um, uh, self-esteem is an illusion. It's a form of persistent, low-level narcissism. And it's much better, instead of chasing self-esteem, it's much better to just view your life as a series of decisions and actions. And that's where you get true freedom. It's not from building yourself up to the highest pedestal like your friend, the man. Uh, If that stuff was all able to be um, recalibrated into decisions and actions. I'm a ball player. You're the power lifter, and now you're a film student, and you're just going to plunge full bore into that bore. Then then (laughs) Then you thrive. Yeah. And it's like, how did you get to, how did you get to film school with that intense competitiveness? Probably your powerlifting skills and discipline and focus helped you get an edge over the competition. Well, you know, you know what it was? It's funny that you say that because I was disciplined. Like we, I went to a community college and while I went to a community college and other kids were like just barely learning how to edit, I was, I would rent out the editing room for like the entire weekend for like, you know, the whole day because nobody else was nice. in there. So there was like one editing room. You're like Bill Gates on the, there was on the one, supercomputer. You yeah, know that story? There was one editing room. Chris, what does Chris Bell and Bill Gates have in common? <laughs> and nobody Competitive used to, advantage. Nobody used to sign out to like go in and edit. Nice. And I would shoot music videos with my friends and go in and, and edit them because I felt like I had an advantage. Like I have this place where I can go edit this stuff and I can put this together. Whereas my friends looked at it as like, oh, that's extra work. This is school. Yeah. I didn't look at it as school. I looked at it as like, I'm going into this like film production yeah. class to kick everybody's ass. And then when I went to USC, I remember like the, so like the first day I was at USC film school, um, they showed like the first, like the first kid made his first film and he put it up and I was like, Oh my God, this guy like knows what he's doing, man. Like he, every shot looked beautiful and yeah. it was all, but it, but it, his movie didn't say anything. Right. Ah, and then it's just put a up, skill. He's just got and the they skills. Put up my movie and my movie was funny. And the whole class laughed. 
and oh and it was God. like the very first day. It was like the first. Um, it was actually the the third week of film school where mm-hmm. you had to turn in your first film. Wow! And so everybody's really nervous. Like, what are these? Ki-? And I'm going like, holy shit! These guys are like, they're killing me with the with the movies they're making. Yeah. Like, I can't the shoot. The aspect ratio is I can't, ideal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can't like, shoot. What the like, hell's that I'm mean? I'm cinematographer like that. My shit's all out of focus and whatever. <laughs> but the whole entire class is dying laughing the whole time. And the teacher goes right after we get done. He's like, "You, my friend, have a stamp." He was this uh, big black guy, Oscar. He's like, you have a stamp. When you make a movie, we know it's a Chris Bell movie. Yeah. So, and it's like, that's, wow. after, the first, so true, that's after the first thing I ever made. I'm like, how do you know I have a stamp? Because I could just tell. He's like, you're that guy. You're that guy that makes something that's so different. Wow. And I was like, and it just gave me all the confidence in the world. Yeah. Like yeah. you said that um, I didn't put any, um, it's, it's funny that you say that because I didn't put any, va- like, any um, value into like, being at the best film school and being competitive, mm-hmm. I just did it. Like yeah. I just was there and I just did what I had to do. Yeah, you were focused on the process. I never focused on being the best guy. Right. I never focused on trying to you, get out of there. You weren't there and patting yourself movie. on the back for being admitted to SC Film School, like possibly some of the some of the kids are yeah. these days. You know? Some of the like, kids I went to class with, like my friend Rick Famuyiwa, he directed three episodes of The Mandalorian, so he's crushing it. Wow. You know, he he's done really well. Uh, Rich Kelly, he did Donnie Darko. He was mm-hmm. one of my classmates. So some of the kids did really good really good stuff and went on to do some really cool yeah. things so it's cool to be in that company you know it is. it's cool to be in your company oh my gosh tell what people a... where they can find your uh, podcast and your your you can, website you can find the brad podcast anywhere podcasts are sold oh it's free and then bradkerns.com yeah check out the morning routine online course it's really fun and it'll get you motivated and you can pick and choose and learn something to put together so i like that and there's all kinds of other fun stuff there email newsletter list. I have the Carnivore Scores food rankings chart. Speaking of That's amazing. eating in a nutrient-dense manner, so right there on the homepage, you download this free PDF, print it out, put it on your fridge, and you'll emphasize the most nutritious foods in every category. So it's a, at a glance, a lot of good education about how to optimize your diet. I might have to print that out and put it on my fridge. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll there you go. I'm thinking the same thing. That's right great. on. All right, Brad. Great Thanks, guys. Everybody. Yeah, dun, dun, great to dun, see dun. you, man. Thanks, Russell. Yeah. Thanks. We're-